I came into, back into DLA. I had left DLA in 2004, retired from the Army as, a, as a, the director of land, uh, um, uh, land-based weapons systems directorate. I came back in 2008 as the acquisition executive for a land and maritime. The very first mission that I had coming back was the support of the MRAPs. The, the challenge in that was that we were deploying a whole variety, the United States was deploying a whole variety of MRAPs, um, but the threat was continuing to change. If you go back to the, to the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, one of the things that was going on, and I'm, you know, we, we uh, um, uh, we invaded Iraq uh, in 2003. Uh, from that point until around 2007, the uh, U.S. was taking a lot of ca casualties from uh, what was called IEDs or um, improvised explosive devices. Uh, we were taking a lot of casualties. Our up-armored Humvees, uh, even though they were up-armored, and just our soft-skinned vehicles, just were no match for uh, these IEDs, and we were losing a lot of soldiers uh, and Marines uh, to those uh, to those bombs, roadside bombs, and those kinds of things. Uh, so th the force needed some up, something else to protect them, um, uh, and and so in 2007, the Secretary of Defense made a commitment to to start the deploying, developing, and deploying uh, mine resistance. Uh, armor protection devices or MRAPs uh, and putting those in the field so we can protect our soldiers and, and allow people to come home. The criticality of getting these vehicles on the battlefield in sufficient quantities to make a difference was really stressing uh, industry at the time. And so the industry was at, at the same time they were trying to produce MRAPs to put on the field, the configurations of the MRAPs they were making were changing even as they were coming down the, down the production line. And from a logistician point of view, which is where Land and Maritime and DLA came in, we were now having to uh, buy parts in support of systems that were, even before we bought the parts, were becoming obsolete because they had been superseded by some other variation. Um, so uh, our challenge was to get the right tech data, to get in with the suppliers, to make sure we got ahead of the curve, uh, to buy the right things at the right time, to get it in the hands of our soldiers and Marines uh, so that we could protect their life. It didn't do any good to put an MRAP in the field and it doesn't run or it doesn't have the parts to sustain it. Uh, it just becomes a, um, becomes a stationary peel box, right? So we had to get that, we had to solve that logistics problem. Um, and my role was, was trying to help facilitate that process. We had a lot of great folks. We had a lot of technical people uh, from, our, uh, from our engineering standpoint. We had the, the buying activities, both in the Marines and the Army. Uh, and then we worked very closely, uh, very closely uh, with the suppliers. And we had a variety of suppliers or, or, or around the United States who were struggling, quite frankly, to, 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 to meet the demand for the vehicles and then meet the demand for changing threat and then meet the demand for the logistics. And so it took a lot of work and effort. Um, uh, around here it was MRAP in the morning and it was MRAP at night and uh, MRAP in between because we were, we were constantly trying to figure out, and, and, and I used to call it looking around the corner to fee see what, what was coming on at us so we could be in a better position and a better posture to support uh, the, the, the field. Failure was not an option. We, we, needed, to, we needed to be successful. And I, I, and I, would, I would say, well, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an acquisition professional, uh, while we talk a lot about our contractors and our contracted community, uh, there, there are some great Americans. Uh, without, with our industrial, without our industrial base, that couldn't happen. Uh, without, our, without our people and their dedication, uh, we weren't going to be successful in, in supporting. Um, I, I will tell you, even, at, even though I'm a retired, I'm retired now, uh, even in retirement, a lot of the relationships we built, personally built back in those days, endure. I still converse with, with the folks on the other side who were on the, in, in the industry. 
and not as a business relationship, but just because we had a tough problem and together, and it literally was together, uh, we saw the power of what the industry and government uh, and the Department of Defense can do uh, if we work together. So uh, those, those relationships endure. There were, there were a number of armored vehicles within the, the inventory, both for the Marines and the Army. Uh, but they were, uh, the difference with the MRAP was its ability to um, uh, disperse the energy from a, from a bomb, a ROSAP bomb, and, and, and that's primarily because of the V-shaped hull that, that's, that's within the vehicle. Uh, uh, Humvees or flat bottoms, uh, the light, uh, the light uh, uh, armored vehicle for the Marine Corps is a flat bottom. And so when a bomb goes off, all of that blast effect goes right through the vehicle and also, you know, generally disable the crew and, and, and that. So we had armored vehicles, um, but, uh, and, and for most of the force, they didn't even have, up, they didn't have the armor. They were, we, we, we would call in the military soft skin vehicles. Uh, so the MRAP changed that dynamic and it gave, and it put the, the V hull vehicles, and that's really the, that's really the, the key of a, an MRAP is the V hull, so it disperses the uh, the, the shock. The DLA role, we, we were not the buying activity for the vehicles. Uh, the Marines did that, and the Army did that, and they were the buying command, so they were buying the the end item itself, the MRAP itself. Our job was to make sure that when they bought the end item, that once they got into theater, which is the standard mission for DLA, is that we had the parts to support it and sustain it. Our mission turned on as soon as the first MRAP hit the ground. I mean, so, um, because again, once the system's on the ground and being used, um, you have to support it. Uh, you, and you have to support it immediately. And, and that's what we tried to do. Obviously, we couldn't do it immediately, but we had to take that time and make it as short as humanly possible. And that was a challenge for us. Uh, spend no more time than we need, than was absolutely necessary to make sure we got the parts. And so the challenge was doing that in a, in a, in a world where the configurations were, um, I had quite frankly never seen anything like it, the configuration, and then for good reason. The threat, as we deployed an MRAP, uh, the, the threat was, you know, the threat changed because these guys were smart. I mean, they didn't just sit back and say, okay, well, they deployed an MRAP. What they started to do was to, they started to adapt. And then we had to adapt, and then, and so on and so on, and, and so it became a, it, it was a constant battle to try to stay ahead of that curve. The only thing I would just say again, I, just to reiterate, uh, uh, that was a great team effort. I mean, if you, when folks are looking for what, how do you make it, how does it, you know, how do you get everybody together and, and get one common purpose, um, I, I think that's, that, that was a, you know, that was it. And, 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 and to now, I think, you know, as we wind down in Afghanistan and we don't wind down in Iraq, um, we probably, as a nation, we've moved on, quite frankly. What I can tell you, though, that there are a lot of fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, aunts and uncles, who remember and understand that were it not for the MRAPs, they, didn't, they wouldn't come home.